Uh, my name is Julian. I'm a tech evangelist, um, and I'm focusing on machine learning. And um, in this session, we're going to cover all kinds of different things. It's actually very dense. Um, of course, we're going to talk about running TensorFlow on, on SageMaker. And, um, and we're going to hear from Fannie Mae. And we're super, super happy to have them on stage with us. Uh, Bin and Vinden, thank you very much. Uh, Bin will tell you about the use case for uh, TensorFlow and deep learning at Fannie Mae. And Vindan will go very, very deep on the operational and security and compliance uh, aspects of uh, running SageMaker in, uh, in a regulated industry, because that's what you guys do have heard, right? <laughs> and there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of work there. And um, then I'll come back and, uh, and I'll do a, a demo of uh, uh, TensorFlow, actually Keras, on SageMaker using uh, most of the new services that we announced on SageMaker in the last few days. So let's get started. So maybe just a quick word about TensorFlow. Uh, who's using TensorFlow in production today? All right, a um, few people, thank you. So uh, as you probably know, TensorFlow is an open source library for machine learning and deep learning. Uh, it's fair to say it's the, by far the most popular one at the moment. Uh, its main API is in Python with some level of support for additional languages. Uh, TensorFlow has been around for a few years, and um, the uh, 1x versions of TensorFlow use this uh, um, execution mode called symbolic execution. And symbolic execution uh, means that you first define the execution graph. So you use uh, variables, placeholders, tensor operations, which could be simple things like adding tensors or multiplying tensors are really, really complex things like deep learning operations. And um, you define that graph completely, and then you compile it, and it gets optimized. It gets transformed into a different representation, which, uh, which is fast and efficient, but it's also very difficult to inspect, understand, and debug. And then you actually run data through that graph. Okay, which is why we call it define, then run. And you train that graph and you build a model, and it's all good. Uh, except it's difficult to understand, it's difficult to inspect and debug. Uh, you can do this with three different uh, APIs, the low-level API, which is really, really low-level. So I guess if you're trying to write everything from scratch, if you're a researcher, if you need full control over every tiny bit, that's fine. Um, there's the... I want to call it the mid-level API now. should fix the slide. Um, the uh, tf.estimator API, which makes it a little easier to work with TensorFlow using um, slightly more abstract objects for training and deployment. And then you have the proper high-level API called Keras, right? And I have to say that's my favorite one. Um, it's very beginner-friendly, and you can still customize a lot of things. And Keras comes with a lot of layers for um, deep learning um, models, uh, convolution, LSTM, pretty much everything you would need. Uh, at, the, at the end of the September, sorry, uh, TensorFlow 2.0 came out, and TensorFlow 2.0 has a number of improvements that you would expect, and the, the main one to me is we're moving from symbolic execution to imperative execution. And imperative execution is a, is a fancy word for a very simple thing. Imperative execution is just writing code as we know it, right? writing a line of code and running it, and writing another line of code and running it. So there's no, um, there's no uh, splitting, you know, building the graph and, and running the graph. So you build and run at, at once, okay? And that makes it, that's the natural way to write code, just like we would with NumPy. And so it makes it easy to run it, understand it, um, debug it, you know, you can have breakpoints, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a much more natural way of writing code. And um, I'm quite happy also about the fact that Keras is now the preferred API. Uh, so uh, you, you still have all those Keras layers, but you can really use them in an imperative way. And you can go from f uh, very high level code for quick sp experimentation to very, very custom code, you know, custom training loops and custom layers and custom everything pretty much uh, using Keras uh, only and to me, that's pretty good news. 
Uh, as it turns out, we have uh, quite, a few, uh, quite a few customers running uh, uh, TensorFlow on, uh, on AWS, um, and all kinds of customers, right? Uh, startups, um, large enterprise customers in all verticals. So if you ask me who's the typical customer for TensorFlow on, uh, on AWS, it's, it's a very hard question, or a very simple, I guess, because the answer is, you know, everyone, right? And um, this new report from October 2019 um, told us that 89% of all deep learning workloads in the cloud run on AWS, and a large bit of that is TensorFlow. Uh, quoting from memory, I think it's 60 plus percent, at least. And if we zoom in on TensorFlow, 85% of all cloud-based TensorFlow runs on AWS. Okay, so I think that gives us a responsibility to build the best possible version of TensorFlow, and Andy in the keynote mentioned a few benchmarks showing that we're really investing on that. Um, and it also um, pushes us to make TensorFlow simple and, and easy to get started with, which is why, of course, it is a first-class citizen in Amazon SageMaker. We have built-in containers for training on CPU, GPU, and prediction as well. All that code is open source. You can get it on GitHub. You can build those containers locally on your machine, uh, run them on your machine, customize them, etc. cetera. Um, we support all versions all the way to 115, not 114. 115 just came out. And 2.0 is coming very soon. But when I'm talking about TensorFlow on, uh, on SageMaker, it's not just the TensorFlow library, right? Um, that, that would not be enough if you ask me. It's also all the standard tools that you may know and like, like TensorBolt for visualization, TensorFlow serving to deploy models using that model server, and of course, all the SageMaker features that make TensorFlow on AWS more scalable and easier to work with generally. Things like you know, using local mode, script mode. Um, I will show you these in, in the demo. Uh, automatic model tuning, uh, using spot instances for training, using pipe mode, to stream data from S3 to training instances, uh, storing your data sets in EFS or FSx if you need ultra low latency training instead of uh, using S3, elastic inference, and more. I mean, the, the list goes on, right? So all these features in SageMaker just generally make machine learning easier and more cost effective, and they also apply to TensorFlow. Um, we're also applying quite a lot of uh, energy and time to optimize TensorFlow on AWS. We have a dedicated team working on that, doing nothing but this, to give you the best training and prediction performance, no matter which platform you're using. And we're also working with Intel on specific optimizations. And of course, you have distributed training out of the box using either the parameter server mode, which is the um, um, default mode in TensorFlow, or uh, Horovod, that uh, super cool open source project that lets you scale distributed training to uh, all the way to the moon, I suppose. And, uh, and by the way, we're uh, heavily contributing to uh, that project. So that's already pretty f good, if you ask me. <laughs> and then there's the new stuff, right? Um, so if you, uh, if you paid attention to the keynote, you, you, know, you had those uh, new services uh, announced. So the first one is called SageMaker Studio. It's a machine learning IDE um, where you can just define and build and deploy and debug and monitor your uh, SageMaker models. Um, and of course, that means TensorFlow too. SageMaker Notebooks, still in preview, is uh, an evolution of notebook instances. Uh, so previously in SageMaker, you would create a notebook instance to run your notebooks, etc. Now you don't have to do this anymore. You just go to Studio and, uh, and open, a, 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 I don't want to say serverless notebook, because we tend to stick serverless everywhere now, but uh, you just open a notebook. You can get to work very quickly. You can package the notebooks with their full context, the data set, et cetera, and share them with coworkers. So that's a, that's a nice improvement. We also announced SageMaker Debugger. Um, so SageMaker Debugger will automatically inspect your training jobs for weird conditions that may be developing, things like uh, um, exploding gradients, vanishing gradients, etc. And it's going to alert you that something's not quite right. It sends CloudWatch alerts, and you can act on that. 
Uh, SageMaker Experiments is another capability that lets you automatically track uh, an unlimited number of training jobs, data processing jobs, um, model tuning jobs, etc. And uh, meaning all the metadata, all the metrics for those jobs get pushed automatically to experiments, and then you can query and search and compare all those experiments with the, the experiments SDK. Uh, model monitor is uh, basically production monitoring for your uh, uh, endpoints, for your uh, SageMaker models in production. And uh, it, it does two things. It's going to capture data automatically, in, in input data and output data predictions. So that's really easy to set up. I'll show you how to do this. And then, if you want, uh, it will compare that capture data to a baseline that you provided using the training set. And the idea here is saying, okay, here's my training set. It has certain statistical properties, okay? So compute that and check that incoming data, right? Data sent to my endpoint for prediction is in line with that, okay? Because if I start seeing incoming data that drifts from the baseline, then my predictions are going to go down in quality, right? So data drift is a problem that it's going to pick up. Um, uh, data quality issue in general, uh, if uh, you know, features are missing or if they're the wrong type, et cetera, model monitor will pick it up. And last but not least, SageMaker Autopilot, which automatically uh, builds a machine learning model for you, going through all the steps. Uh, starting from your data set in S3 and the, the uh, attribute you want to predict. It's going to automatically figure out uh, the type of problem you want to solve. Is it classification? Is it regression? It's going to automatically come up with the pre-processing scripts that need to be applied to your data. Uh, it will pick up a bunch of candidate algos that should work well on that kind of problem. And then it's going to run um, um, uh, optimization jobs to, uh, to figure out the best list of candidates, okay? And it's going to show you those 5, 10, 20 candidates, depending on how many you want. Um, and it's also going to provide you all the code that was used to build and train those candidates. And it's, uh, it's actually visible in a generated notebook. So you get a notebook telling you, these are, let's say, the 10 candidates I came up with and you can run that code, and you can uh, understand how the model was built, how the data was pre-processed, and you can keep tweaking if you want. Okay, so that's autopilot. So I'll try to show you as many as possible um, in the demo, but now it's time to uh, welcome Bin, so please let's hear it for uh, Bin and, and Vinden in a few minutes. <laughs> the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Bin Lu. I'm director of risk modeling and analytics at Fannie Mae. So I'm going to provide an overview of Fannie Mae usage of Amazon SageMaker from business perspective using property valuation. Vindam Sahayam, Fannie Mae's lead architect, will present architectural design for enabling Amazon SageMaker at enterprise level. Fannie Mae is a leading source of financing for mortgage lenders. We provide access to affordable mortgage financing in all markets. We effectively manage and reduce risk to our business, taxpayers, and the housing finance system. In 2018, Fannie Mae provided $512 billion in liquidity to mortgage markets. Fannie Mae's credit portfolio is $3 trillion. It is very important to have accurate property valuation to reduce mortgage risk. The property valuation is used in all stages of loan life cycle. We use it for loan approval, post-purchase quality control, portfolio risk management, financial reporting, regulatory reporting, and loss mitigation. A typical property valuation by a certified appraiser takes two steps. The first step is quantitative valuation based on observable inputs, such as 
comparable property sale prices, and the current market trends. The second step is adjustments for unobservable inputs, such as location, square footage, and condition of the property. Fannie Mae is leveraging machine learning to improve property valuation. We have developed automated home price valuation model based on observable inputs for wider coverage and accuracy. We are also working on developing property image classification model for automated review of the appraisal adjustments based on visual inspection using TensorFlow. Fannie Mae receives 40,000 appraisal reports with more than 500,000 property images every day. It is very time consuming to review those property images. An experienced appraiser can only process a few hundreds of images per day. We want to develop an automated system to capture the knowledge of the most experienced appraisers and to enable review of these images timely and objectively. We have many technology challenges in developing machine learning models. For example, the hyperparameter tuning of the automated home price valuation model in more than 200 markets will run for more than 200 days on a single server. Training and running the property image classification model are also compute intensive. It is really difficult to provision the required compute resources and storage resources on premises. It is also complex to code to train and deploy these models. We're looking for a flexible and self-service machine learning platform on cloud. We want to have easy access to compute resources and data. We want to have streamlined model development, training, and deployment. We also want to build in governance procedures and audit trail. Amazon SageMaker fits our needs. We have used Amazon SageMaker to develop the automated property image classification model. It comprises three multi-layer convolutional neural network models with transferred learning. The first model fixes image orientation. The second model identifies a room type. And the third model predicts marketability of the room. In this example, the model correctly identifies that the image orientation is 90 degree, and the room is an upscale luxury kitchen. We're able to process more than 500,000 images per day by running on multiple GPUs in parallel. There are many benefits of using Amazon SageMaker. First of all, it is cost effective. We never pay for idle. We can achieve performance improvement at zero cost. For example, if a job run on one GPU for 10 hours, the cost is the same as if you run on 10 GPU for one hour. It also reduces the time to market. It provides instant access to dedicated computing resources. We're able to focus on business needs and model development. There is no server to manage and no complex system code to write for distributed model training, hyperparameter tuning, or model deployment. Amazon SageMaker is part of the larger AWS ecosystem. It enables us to have streamlined integration with 
big data analytic platform, secured workload management, and the business resiliency. The following are considerations for provisioning Amazon SageMaker at Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae is in a highly regulated industry. Implementation of security and governance is as important as developing business capabilities. We should also consider data gravity. Since Amazon SageMaker can be easily provisioned in any AWS account, it allows us to preserve a single source of truth by co-locating machine learning platform with data. We have engaged with Amazon SageMaker team early to start our journey. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Fannie Mae Digital Incubator team for developing the property image classification model. I'm now turning the presentation to Vindam Sahayam, who will walk us through how we solution for security, governance, and enable Amazon SageMaker at the enterprise level. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I am Vindan Sakayam. So Ben walked us through the uh, benefits and use cases of SageMaker and Fannie Mae. So when it came down to enabling SageMaker in a large and highly regulated enterprise such as Fannie Mae, there are certain goals that we have to meet to get it approved by our uh, very strict information security and compliance folks and by our auditors. We had three very important goals. Let's look at what they are. Uh, we wanted the solution to keep the data super secure. We wanted to enable or empower our users with self-service access. We wanted to give flexibility to the users uh, without which there will be very little adoption. And lastly, uh, and also important is, uh, we wanted the solution to support governance, both from a model and data perspective, and as well uh, support end-to-end -end traceability. So with these three extremely important goals, is it possible to achieve all these three with a fully managed service such as Amazon SageMaker. Let's look at our journey, what we did, uh, how we partnered with the, uh, the service team to meet these goals uh, and enabled SageMaker and Fannie Mae. Let's start with uh, data security, which is our first goal. Uh, there are two key challenges. Um, in enabling SageMaker in a data science research environment. The first one is, uh, as you all know, SageMaker infrastructure is deployed in a, a fully managed, Amazon managed VPCs and subnets. Uh, you don't have a lot of control in configuring uh, network and security settings. Uh, the uh, subnets are sh shared among multiple customers. So that's the first challenge. Uh, the second challenge is data scientists, as you all know, uh, they use powerful dev tools. Uh, they use terminals. Uh, they are able to install libraries and softwares, and they can develop programs. And they also work with highly sensitive data. So with these two challenges, how do we keep data absolutely secure? Right, so let's see what we did, uh, starting with uh, how we hardened our net network security. So in this diagram, uh, to your right, you see the uh, SageMaker infrastructure uh, deployed in Amazon-managed uh, VPCs. The containers and uh, notebooks, uh, they have uh, internet access by default. 
uh, how do you avoid or prevent data exfiltration? You don't want your users to remove the data and move it to a, a bucket that doesn't belong to your organization. So it turns out that SageMaker gives you hooks and allows you to uh, connect the containers and notebooks to your VPC. Uh, so when you do that, uh, SageMaker creates ENIs in uh, Fannie Mae's VPC or in your VPC, the customer VPC. Uh, and using that, you can control traffic and internet access. So with ENIs and uh, with ENIs in your VPC, uh, you also want to make sure uh, you configure S3 endpoint policies. Uh, you don't want a, a malicious user or a malicious code to, uh, you know, again, to move the data to some bucket which doesn't belong to your organization. And this is very, very important uh, that, uh, you know, you utilize the uh, gateway endpoint policies uh, for that. So there is another feature called network isolation, which SageMaker supports. Uh, with, when you enable network isolation, your containers are uh, completely isolated and can't make any uh, outbound calls. So you can use network isolation in conjunction with uh, VPC configuration, and we will look at uh, that a little deeper in the uh, next slide. So with the data exfiltration taken care, uh, how do you avoid data being exposed to internet and keep the communication between uh, Fannie Mae and uh, SageMaker service completely private? Well, you can use uh, AWS private links, and SageMaker has full support for private links. Uh, it supports uh, APIs, runtimes, and notebook endpoints. So AWS private links uh, endpoints uses uh, private IPs and security groups uh, uh, right in your VPC. So the SageMaker service that you see on the right is accessed as if it's hosted right in your VPC. Um, so that is a very crucial thing that you want to take advantage of. Um, so there are also endpoint policies that you can attach to the uh, uh, inter uh, private link endpoints, and we'll go through some examples of that as well. So this is a slightly deeper link, uh, sorry, deeper look into the uh, uh, training job architecture with both VPC configuration and network isolation enabled. As I mentioned earlier, uh, with network isolation, your training job is completely isolated. It can't make any outbound calls even to other AWS services such as S3. So you might ask, how then will my training job upload and download data to S3? Let's look at that. So this slide shows uh, a training job which, runs in, which is running in a, a distributed mode in, uh, in two, uh, using two EC2 instances, which you see on the middle. Each node has three containers. There is a data agent container. There is an algorithm container. An algorithm container is the one which is actually running your algorithm. Uh, and this is what I uh, said uh, will not have any uh, outbound access. And there is also a log agent container. So the data agent container has an ENI created on in your VPC, in Fannie Mae's VPC, which you see on the far left. Uh, so there, there are two ENIs created in uh, Fannie Mae's VPC because there are two data agents, one per each EC2 instance. So it is through these data agents, upload and download of S3 data happens. And again, that happens through the S3, uh, your S3 gateway endpoint. The algorithm uh, agents or containers, they have ENIs created within the platform, within, in a different subnet that you see on the far right. And these network interfaces, the algorithm network interfaces, they are purely used for peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication uh, in the case of distributed training jobs. 
this is an example of an interface endpoint uh, enforcement. Uh, the box to the left uh, uh, it shows a, uh, is a policy that can be attached to the uh, uh, SageMaker API interface endpoint. And it says that it, the, connection, the call can be made only if it is originating from a certain VPC and from certain uh, uh, VPC side of blocks. Uh, the box to the right uh, is an identity policy, and whoever is using it can only make that particular action uh, uh, using a particular uh, interface endpoint. So let's move to the uh, next aspect of data security, uh, encryption. Our information security uh, mandates that we encrypt data both at rest and in transit. And also, uh, we use KEKs and rotate it every, at least every two years. Uh, SageMaker supports uh, encrypting your volumes that are attached to your containers and notebooks. Uh, when you, you can also pass a KMS key ID, and when you pass that to a training job, uh, uh, the training job uses that to uh, encrypt uh, the model artifacts when it writes it to S3. Uh, we also suggest that you enable default bucket encryption, and additionally, you can also uh, put in deny policies. Uh, for example, if you have a SSC uh, KMS uh, deny policy, that would, uh, and if someone is trying to do a SSC S3 upload, uh, that operation would fail. Um, SageMaker also supports inter-container traffic encryption in the case of distributed training jobs. So we, we met our first goal, data security. Let's move on to our second goal, which is uh, self-service access. Uh, we wanted, as I, uh, as I said earlier, we wanted to give maximum flexibility uh, to our users. Uh, we want to give them necessary IAM permissions for them to write APIs, use uh, the SageMaker SDKs from their Jupyter notebooks. Um, so all this flexibility is great, but how do you make sure your users comply with the security controls, the, the encryption controls, and the network controls that we talked about earlier? Uh, SageMaker IAM context keys is the answer. This is something we uh, worked with the service team uh, to get this feature incorporated as part of the product. This is pretty new. and. Uh, was released in the last few months. So using the context keys, you are able to uh, uh, do this enforcement in IAM, and your user would be able to make, a, for example, a training job API call only if, the, only if he or she passes all the network and uh, encryption and other uh, security settings. Um, we use service catalog for provisioning, uh, especially for our notebooks. So SageMaker, uh, so our environment is multi-user environment, meaning we have multiple users and business units sharing the same Amazon account. So how do you make sure your users don't step into each other? Um, well, the answer is you can use tagging, and SageMaker supports tagging. Uh, it has full support for tagging. All the resources can be tagged, and SageMaker's IAM actions uh, they also support tagging. So this is an example of uh, the uh, controls enforcement. Uh, the box to the uh, left is, uh, the, are the new context keys. Uh, again, this example says uh, the create training job uh, API can be only invoked if you pass all the uh, uh, network settings and security settings, encryption, KMS keys, et cetera. The, the policy to the right is an example which you can use to uh, uh, enable a single notebook user experience. So we met our second goal, uh, you know, self-service access. Uh, let's move on to the third goal, uh, which is enabling governance. Um, so we wanted to establish guardrails very early in the game um, and establish what, are, what we call as operating zones, starting with the uh, research zone. Research zone is kind of unique, as you know. Uh, it needs access to uh, production data. 
And this is where your data scientists play with uh, data and create models. And once a model is chosen for uh, an application deployment, it's moved to the application zone. And in the application zone, it's packaged as part of the application. And after due testing, it moves to production. And uh, in production, you have an option to uh, retrain and replace the uh, model. Uh, uh, after an approval stage. This is an example of an orchestration pipeline uh, we used to uh, automate uh, our machine learning workflows. Uh, this is a reusable uh, pipeline. It takes uh, the training data set in S3, uh, the code in uh, code commit, and creates an ECR image uh, builds an ECR image, uh, trains the model, deploys the model. Um, everything from the, uh, the version of the uh, S3 uh, training data set, the Git hash, uh, the ECR image, uh, the training job, the hyperparameters, uh, the model, everything is tracked in a, a DynamoDB table for auditability purposes. Uh, we built this using code pipeline, but there are other options such as uh, step functions and uh, Apache Airflow if you want to use that. Uh, so before I wrap up, let's take a quick look at our enterprise data lake. So over the last three to four years in Fannie Mae, we embarked on a journey uh, to collect, classify, and curate data in a centralized location, mainly to support analytics. Uh, so the result is today we have about 3,000 distinct data sets uh, stored in a secure location, easily discoverable platform. With this kind of data gravity and the kind of tool sets that the Enterprise Data Lake platform provides us, it only makes, made sense to use this platform as a foundation to build uh, additional capabilities such as SageMaker. And that's what we did at uh, SageMaker in Fannie Mae today is hosted in the uh, Enterprise Data Lake platform, and it takes advantage of the data and the tool sets uh, that are there in the Enterprise Data Lake platform. And this is the reference architecture of our Enterprise Data Lake platform. I'm not going to get into the details of this, uh, but the key point I want to highlight is uh, the EDL platform, our Enterprise Data Lake platform is uh, built completely using uh, AWS native services, and that made integrating uh, services such as SageMaker much easier. We didn't have to deal with a lot of uh, integration challenges. Uh, key takeaways, you want to use the uh, newly released IAM context keys. Uh, they are extremely valuable, uh, especially if you want to enable self-service to your users, um, I mean, I'm sure you want to enable self-service, otherwise no data scientist is going to use SageMaker. Uh, you want to restrict access to your buckets using IAM policy, bucket policy, but more importantly, you also want to control uh, your access using S3 gateway endpoint policy. You don't want a malicious uh, code or user to remove the data to a different bucket or a user moving the data to a, his or her own personal bucket. Um, Amazon SageMaker has full support for private rings, uh, for APIs, runtimes, and notebooks. Uh, utilizing that is crucial to keep the communication uh, completely private within the AWS backbone network. Uh, unlike DevOps, where it's all about code, in machine learning, data is a first-class primitive. Uh, you want to keep track of data collection and preparation, and you want to establish end-to-end -end traceability uh, and uh, you want to make your predictions uh, traceable back to the original training record. Introduce segregation, especially between the research zone and the uh, application zone. And lastly, if you don't have an enterprise data lake, build one. Uh, you would see as the uh, data lake builds momentum, as it adds more data, as it attracts more users, it tremendously will benefit your organization promoting collaboration among your users. With that, uh, you can build a highly secure, 
a self-service, an end-to-end -end traceable machine learning capability with SageMaker. And that's the journey we started. And SageMaker has become a centerpiece of our machine learning capability in Fannie Mae. Thank you. All right. Well done. All right. Three trillion dollars. All right. Interesting. Okay, let me switch to my laptop just quickly. And I, I think this is a really, really great talk because the, we, know, we keep obsessing when we talk about machine learning, and I guess that's what I'm going to do now. We, we, we like to obsess about neural networks and, and algorithms and parameters and all that stuff. And, and we play in, in a sandbox, and, and that's all right. But when you try to take that technology and put it in production in a very serious business like Fannie Mae, um, you know, I don't want to say machine learning becomes the tiny part of it, but compliance, infrastructure, security, that's engineering, right? It's, it's a really, really big part of the job. And uh, so next time somebody tells me machine learning in the cloud cannot be secure, I will send you a DEX. Thank you. <laughs> Making my job easier. OK, um, so let's, uh, let's go through, uh, let's look at some, some code right now. So I'm going to show you uh, a deep learning um, um, demo based on Keras, my favorite API in TensorFlow. And we're going to start from, um, we're going to start from this data set, which is called Fashion MNIST. Uh, and as you can see, it's uh, built of uh, fashion articles. This was designed by a company called Zalando, and they happen to sell that stuff. Uh, and this is a drop-in replacement for MNIST, which we're all very tired of. So let's start with a Keras script, building a simple image classifier for this. So let's quickly look at the code. And oh, it's fine if you're not um, uh, a Keras specialist. Um, what I want to show you here is two things. I want to show you how to write code. And it could be TensorFlow, it could be PyTorch, it could be scikit-learn. It's the same story. I want, to, I want to show you how to write code that you can run exactly the same on your laptop and in SageMaker. And when I mean exactly the same, I mean exactly the same. And that's the first thing. The second thing I want to sh you'll see in that code, actually, um, is that, well, it, it is vanilla Keras code. And everything I'm going to do next, from debugging to everything else, doesn't require a line of extra code in this. So you can take the code that runs on your laptop, take it all the way to SageMaker, and apply all those new services that we launched. OK, so the first thing here, like I said, let me zoom out a bit, is how do we make sure we can run that same code on our laptop and on SageMaker unmodified, untouched? OK, and to do this, we need this feature that I mentioned earlier called script mode. It's called like that because when SageMaker runs your code inside the built-in container for TensorFlow, it is going to run it like a script. So it's going to call Python myscript.py with command line arguments. Okay? So you have to make sure that your, uh, any hyperparameter that you want to pass to your script, and like these, um, are, um, can be passed as command line arguments. Okay, this is how SageMaker will pass hyperparameters to your code. Okay, the first thing you need to do, and I guess you would probably do that anyway, right? Uh, even if you were running your code locally. And the second bit you need to take care of is read those four environment variables, right? Because they'll tell you uh, where SageMaker uh, has stored or is expecting the data to be the training set, the validation set and where to save the trained model. So if you write your code this way, and that's the only thing you need to do, you can run it unmodified on your laptop all the way to SageMaker. And the rest is absolutely vanilla code, right? So fetch the fashion MNIST data set, which is already split in training and validation. Do very, very basic normalization on, on the pictures. Do very basic encoding on the categories. And then build two convolution blocks and a fully connected block. So that's uh, CNN 101, I suppose. 
and compile the model, right? Fit, so train the model on the training set, validating with the validation set, evaluating the accuracy, printing out some metrics, and saving the model in TensorFlow serving format because that's what SageMaker expects, right, for deployment. Okay, so again, vanilla Keras, just pay attention to the fact that hyperparameters are passed as command arguments, and those uh, environment variables tell you where data is and where the model needs to be stored, okay? All right, so now we can get to work. So, okay, in the first cell here, I'm just downloading my uh, fashion and this data from the internet to um, this uh, notebook instance. Nothing, uh, nothing strange. Okay, the Keras code we already saw. And just to prove my point, okay, you can run this code locally just like this, right? This is how you would do it on your laptop. So I happen to do it in a Jupyter notebook, but it's no different. I'm shelling out and calling my script, um, passing the epochs hyperparameter and, uh, and setting those four environment variables saying, hey, the, the data is in uh, the data directory and please save the model to slash TMP slash model. Okay, which is exactly what SageMaker is going to do later on. And so, okay, it runs for a bit. Well, it runs for one epoch, actually, just to test, okay? And this is a good first step because that's what you're doing on your laptop, coming up with the right architecture, training on a tiny data set, you know, quickly iterating locally on your machine. Fine. At some point, you get to something that you kind of like, and you want to start moving it to SageMaker. So the first step would be... Um, to check that this code runs fine inside the TensorFlow container for SageMaker. And sure, you could fire up a managed instance, right? But, you know, you need a few minutes for those instances to come up, and there's costs associated to that. So a good step is to use what we call local mode. And local mode means, please run my code inside the TensorFlow container on my local machine, right? And you can see that. This is achieved by setting the instance type to local. So what it does is it's going to pull the TensorFlow container to the local machine and run the training script inside that container on your machine. So the benefit is you don't have to wait for instances to come up, and of course you don't pay for them. Okay, so it's, a, it's a, a, an intermediate step where you can keep iterating quickly but validating your code inside the TensorFlow container at no cost, right? Fine, okay, and I'm still using local data for this, and I call fit. Again, you know, we see here, you know, it's not creating an instance, it's just pulling the container and, and training locally. And now I know my code runs inside a container. So in a real life scenario, you would now say, okay, maybe I was in the uh, research zone, like you said, right, and I was doing this stuff on 1% of the data set just to debug my network. Now, okay. Let's throw it over the fence, right? I like this slide. And now let's train the same code on, you know, a terabyte of confidential <laughs> uh, mortgage data, right? So here, I'm, of course, I'm going to keep using the same data set, so I upload it to S3, right? But you could be pointing at the full volumetry uh, uh, in, in your S3 bucket. And now you want to train, okay? So exact same code. The only differences here are now I'm training on a GPU instance, P3 to Excel. And I want to use spot instances because I, you know, I don't want to pay the on-demand price if I can avoid it. And I want to use SageMaker Debugger to check for unwanted conditions such as loss not decreasing or overfitting or I could look for a you know, exploding tensors and vanishing gradients and all those ugly beasts. And all it takes is set some rules. These are predefined rules. And you can also add your own, okay? And again, right, just one line to do each thing. I mean, anybody can write that. If I can write it, anybody can. And the important bit is I still haven't modified a line of my Keras code, right? which is important because who would want to adopt a machine learning service that forces you to rewrite your code, right? I'd be the first one to say no to that, yeah? Okay, so we train, so it trains for, uh, that's about eight minutes or something. Hey, look at this. 
we only get billed for 136 seconds, 70% discount. That thing that says use spot instances is saving me 70%, right? So I think it's worth adding it. I don't know what you think. Um, especially if you train lots of jobs and you do hyperparameter tuning, you know, you end up training uh, hundreds, thousands of jobs every day. So 70% is pretty good, right? Okay, so this train for a few minutes. What about that debugging thing? Hey, let's take a look. So I can describe the training job, and I can say, hey, tell me about those rules that I configured, right? Um, and it went fine. So uh, loss not decreasing was not a problem. So loss did decrease. Uh, overfit did not happen, so that's good news. Okay? And the way under the hood, what's happening when we run that training job is SageMaker debugger actually fires up a second job in parallel using SageMaker processing, one of those new services. And the training job automatically saves uh, parameter and tensor information to S3. And the debugging job reads that information as it comes, right? And it applies those rules to whatever information is available. Okay? And see, if something goes wrong, then it's going to alert you. So we can see in S3, in, the, in that debug output, uh, output prefix, we can see tons of stuff was saved, right? So not very human readable. Fortunately, we have an SDK for that, SM debug, where we can just say, hey, create a trial from all that good stuff that was saved in S3, and tell me about it, right? And I can see a whole bunch of tensors were automatically saved. So, uh, you know, valid, oh, here it's a bunch of metrics. I kept it simple. You can configure more. You could save gradients, weights, anything that you want. Okay, so all these have been automatically saved, and I can keep inspecting, say, all right, show me the values for the loss, okay, the training loss over time. So I have the TensorFlow steps, and I can see the values, right? And you can keep zooming and zooming and zooming, and if one of those debug conditions had been triggered, like exploding tensor or something, you could go and get the, the tensor values for the specific tensor that blew up, and you could see exactly what happened there, right? So it's a, it's a very valuable tool. So you can keep debugging for a long time, but we don't have a long time. Um, one thing you could do here is you could say, all right, I want to deploy that model. It's fine. So maybe it's, a, it's an image model, so I could deploy it to, uh, I want to deploy it to GPU instance. But then maybe it's not a huge model. Maybe I don't need a full-fledged GPU instance. And let's face it, they're a little bit on the expensive side. I agree with that. So if you don't need the full GPU, you can use this service called Elastic Inference. And Elastic Inference lets you attach a fractional GPU acceleration coming in three sizes, medium, large, x-large, to any CPU instance. Okay, so you can find the right cost-performance ratio for, uh, for your uh, accelerated endpoints. In this case, we get similar performance at 80% discount, right? So you can save 70% on training, and you can save 80% on inference. Well, that's a pretty good day. All right, but I'm not going to deploy. I, I want to get more performance from my, uh, from my model. So I could keep exploring those uh, hyperparameters, right? Or I could be lazy, which, as we all know, is a virtue when it comes to software. And I could ask SageMaker to run a model tuning job exploring hyperparameter ranges, OK? So let's do this. So let's say I want to explore different values for epochs, learning rate, batch size. Uh, filters, which is the number of convolution filters in my uh, convolution blocks, the dense layer, which is the size of the fully connected layer classifying the images at the end, and dropout, which is a, a regularization parameter for that dense layer. Okay? So instead of doing it myself, hey, I'm going to say, hey, SageMaker, help me out. You know? Time for my coffee break. Or maybe I've got more important stuff to work on than keep running those jobs manually. So I want to maximize validation accuracy. OK, that's the, that's the goal. Um, but I, I also would like to keep track of all the other metrics that are visible in the training log. So all these things are actually logged in the Keras log. And I can provide regular expressions to fetch them. So all these will be made available to me for further analysis, as we'll see in a minute. All right, and I'll just train in exactly the same way. I removed the, debugged, uh, the debugger uh, rules in this case. And then I run this 
hyperparameter tuner object that puts everything together. The estimator, the metric, the ranges, and I say, hey, please run 20 jobs two by two. Okay, so it's gonna run two jobs, look at the accuracy that it gets, and automatically figure out the next bunch of hyperparameters to train, uh, train two more jobs, be clever again, run two more jobs, be clever again, etc. Okay, and the cleverness here is called Bayesian optimization, and it's a machine learning technique that will quickly converge to uh, high performance jobs. So this runs for a bit, okay, so I run those 20 jobs, and then I wanna know more about it. And what about all those metrics, right? I wanna know which one is the best. So using say, uh, the, the SageMaker experiments SDK, I can say, hey, fetch me all the numbers for these uh, hyperparameter tuning jobs, please, which is about as complicated as this, and I would like to have that stuff in a pandas data frame. Thank you, so here they are, right? I can see my 20 jobs, and I can see tons of metadata here. And I could keep querying individual jobs to get individual metrics. I can see the hyperparameters that were tried on the right-hand side. All right. So I just want the best one. So using pandas, just give me the best one. Okay, that's the guy. 93%, not too bad. And now let's, uh, let's figure out um, where that model is in S3. I can see the S3 uh, artifact here. And now, as a final step, let's deploy it, right? And of course, I wanna make sure, like, we, like I said before, that it performs over time, right? So I'm going to use model monitor to capture data that is sent to the endpoint. So define a place in S3 to save that stuff, create a data capture config, okay? Uh, so this is the simplest uh, setup possible, capture all inputs, all outputs, 100% of traffic, dump that stuff in S3. Right? And then I call deploy, and that will deploy the best model trained by the uh, hyperparameter tuning job using data capture. All right? Okay, so yeah, this is. Uh, all right. Okay, and I can see the training log for that job, and this one actually saved me 70.1%, which is fine. So now it's deployed. I have an HTTPS endpoint that I can query. So let's do that. Let's grab. Uh, a few images from the validation data set, use the predict API in the SDK to HTT post those images to the data set, uh, to the endpoint, sorry, and, and compare predictions with real labels. And it looks like we're, yeah, we have a small mistake, but it's all right. Sometimes, you know, it's not 100% accuracy. So, okay, the endpoint is up. I can predict stuff. Um, so, Let's send more data to it, right? So here I'm gonna go through the full validation data set, 250 images at a time, and push them to the endpoint and predict everything, okay? And keep track of all the labels and all the predicted labels. Just looping around and predicting everything, okay? So it takes a few seconds, and then I can build this thing called the confusion matrix that shows me, uh, you know, what's what, right? Uh, all the predictions, class per class, versus all the real labels. So ideally, we would have a maximal diagonal and zeros everywhere, except, you know, class six here is making our life miserable because a lot of class six items are actually misclassified. So in real life, we would go and zoom in on class six, try to print out some stuff and figure out what's going on, okay? Um, and we could actually see that capture data, right? It's in S3. We can copy it locally, and if we, uh, if we open one of those files, we see captured data. So we see the uh, JSON encoded images that have been sent to the endpoint. And I, I would see the predictions a little lower, right? And I could figure out, I could find images that have been mis misclassified. And then I could go and uh, train a baseline and, and uh, you know, compare those predictions versus the baseline, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But that will be for another time because we don't have time to show you all of it, just give you a taste of it. Um, this code is available on GitLab, you can grab it now, and uh, this is my Twitter account, if you'd like to, uh, to catch up later on, okay? So, here we are, yeah. So just as a conclusion, okay. 
So this is not a full uh, range, the full extent of the SageMaker capabilities. So quite a few new things. Uh, we have lots of blog posts on this stuff. Uh, we have lots of examples on GitHub as well. Um, so look for those. Uh, ping me, ask me questions uh, later. That's what I'm here for. And, uh, and there are plenty of resources out there, right? I guess the, the most important one for you is that uh, GitHub repo, Amazon SageMaker examples, where you'll find hundreds of notebooks to get you started with all the frameworks, whatever you use, and uh, real life use cases. And of course, new, new, new notebooks for all the uh, new services, okay? Um, and I want to take, again, a, a final opportunity to thank Bin and, and Vinden uh, for the uh, fantastic presentation. We're extremely proud to have you on stage with us today. And again, uh, you will be making my life so much easier from now on. So thank you very much. If you have questions, please come to us, and we'll answer your questions. Thank you. <laughs>